Think Forward. Think Research Channel. Hello and welcome to Changing Media, conversations with people who are doing just that in our evolving multimedia universe. I'm Lee Thornton and my guest is Jim Farley, Vice President of News and Programming for the Bonneville-owned WTOP Radio. Here's a fact. Radio news has seen better days thanks to massive corporate buyouts and diminished quantity. Some would also say quality. Here's another fact. Technology today offers stunning possibilities for radio news to be born again. But will satellite radio do for that medium what cable has done for television? What are the real implications for podcasting, for example, for new distribution pathways like streaming, for digital audio production tools? And with concerns over even broader consolidation, what's to happen to the independent broadcaster and non-commercial journalism? We'll talk about all of that and more. Jim, thanks for being here. Happy to be here, Lee. Radio has been pronounced dead uh, more times than history can count, and it's still here. And in every sense, it ain't what it used to be. No, it's not. It's always been able to change and evolve, and that's why it survived. It can provide things that other medium can't at, at times, and it's portable. It goes everywhere you are, and the new technology, far from being a threat, is an opportunity. In fact, you've said radio will survive until you can get TV or cable in your car. Uh, until you can watch it while you're driving. It'll be some sort of Jetsons technology. <laughs> that might put us out of business. But even then, um, since we go everywhere you are, um, radio and radio news in particular is a lifeline for people. Well, we go everywhere you are. Does, is accessibility still the greatest virtue of radio? Yes, and it's getting even better. Um, we started um, streaming audio on the internet, not because we thought it was a new business, but because our radio signals can't penetrate all of the office buildings in Washington. And we were getting emails from people saying, I sure would love to listen to you at work. So we streamed the audio and we looked at that as an additional method of distribution. And that has grown and grown, and it now more than pays for itself. And uh, AM was a dying band, uh, but technology has, has changed all that. Uh, radio is changing um, drastically right now, and a lot of people don't know it yet. We're going to HD radio, high-quality, clear digital audio. Our stations like ours are already broadcasting in HD radio. You won't hear the difference until you buy an HD radio. They'll be in cars starting next year. They'll be in stores by the end of this year. And it's high-quality audio. It makes an FM radio station sound CD quality. It makes an AM radio station sound like an FM radio station does today. And it allows broadcasters to split the signals, to bring you two or three additional streams. So we're going to have a multiplying of the number of radio channels available. Right now, we've got 13,000 radio stations in the United States between commercial and public radio. Most of them are going to be able to double or triple that. And, of course, that involved the Internet. Uh, the Internet is a, a, a great distribution system for radio. It allows us to reach people. I mean, we're an all-news radio station. You we said do... your listeners dragged you to the Internet. Yes, they did. Um, with email, we get constant feedback from people. It's changing the way we do business. It's changing the way we cover the news. Uh, but they would say, hey, I'd like to listen to you here, and I can't get your signal. Why don't you stream? Why don't you put this on the air? Um, and as we looked at all these emails, at one point, we noticed that 40% of the addresses ended in .gov, .mil, .nih, National Institutes of Health, and it dawned on us that here in Washington, we've got this huge audience of people who work for or do business with the federal government. We s sort of split what we did, and we started federalnewsradio.com, streaming audio for the federal workers. It's been so successful that last year we went and bought an AM radio station and put it on. It was the first, we were the, the Internet's first all-news, Internet-only radio station, and now we've become the first 
internet radio station, station to migrate to broadcast. It's WFED. Federal News Radio was profitable from day one. From day one. Uh, we started it with a very small staff, one person. And as we got a little more advertising, we had a second, a third, a fourth. We now have seven full-time journalists doing Federal News Radio. And all WTOP reporters do stories for it as well. And I expect we'll add to the number of journalists working on it next year. What's the cost-benefit ratio of Internet streaming? Uh, initially, there's a cost that all broadcasters look at as it's an expense. But there are ways to make it pay for itself. Um, we have um, hundreds of thousands of people every month who listen to WTOP on the Internet. And it's not limited by where our signals go. We've had email from people listening at the U.S. Embassy in Beijing, people listening on Coast Guard cutters off the coast of, uh, of Greenland. They can listen to us worldwide. There are no borders with mm -hmm. streaming audio. We can go everywhere in the world, literally. You, you've become, according to one source, a kind of de facto voice of America. Uh, it's funny, when we do a Google News search for WTOP, we see that we're quoted by newspapers in India, Pakistan, Qatar. It's amazing the number of people who've glommed onto us as a news source because of the Internet. That is amazing. Um, you, you bought, did you buy a second AM station? For, um, for Federal News Radio. For we Federal an News AM Radio, station. gotcha. For WTOP, an AM station, the Washington market grew beyond the signal of that AM station. So to supplement it, we added a little FM radio station, 107.7 FM. And this little thing only covers 40% of the listening area, but it's now over half of our audience. And an in interesting thing, it's the same programming, news, traffic, and weather on both the AM and the FM, but the average audience on the FM is 10 years younger. These are people who never got in the AM radio listening habit, but they'll go back and forth on their FM dial to their music station, to public radio, to WTOP but they wouldn't have come over to the AM station to do it. We're talking about all these futuristic developments in technology and how they're affecting radio. And you just mentioned news, traffic, weather. The, the clock, or the pie, if you will, is a very old format. Uh, it's been around since 1965, the, the same basic format that works for people. Uh, we can interrupt that clock when we have to, when there's a breaking news story. Uh, we can interrupt it when we do a presidential news conference or some big event, but then we go right back to the clock. Uh, it makes us uh, a reliable source for people, not always predictable, but reliable. You know when you can get your news, your traffic, your weather, your sports scores, your, your Wall Street news, your CBS news on top of the hour. Mm -hmm. So people, people use news radio in the same way uh, they use uh, CNN. They dip in and out. What, in, in any given dip period, what do you want them to hear? Uh, we want them to hear the, the top headlines, a news update, traffic, weather, a sports score, uh, money news. And we want them to come away with one story that makes them go to work and say, you'll never believe what I heard on WTOP this morning. When we do our assignments with our reporters, we want them to come up with something that our listeners didn't know. So you give them that charge as we, an assignment. Absolutely. That's their charge. It's not covering the, all the press conferences that reporters and officials do in the course of the day. It's not all of the crime stories. It's what's new, interesting, useful information for our listeners. That's what keeps us fresh and relevant. Tell me, well, you're about to assign your reporters uh, some, some new technology. Uh, it's funny, I started at All News WINS in 1966, where the official title of the job was Copy Boy. And sort of the running gag at WINS, if you did something well, uh, uh, the editor would say to you, good job, kid, maybe you'll grow up and be the WINS photo assignment editor. It was a very funny joke. Now we've got a sign on the WTOP newsroom door reminding reporters, do you have your digital camera with you? Because they go out and they take photos for our website, which is a news website with its own news staff. And I expect that within two years, instead of digital still cameras, we're going to give them video cameras. I mean, think of the computer on anybody's desk. What that is is a great leveler. It allows a radio station or a newspaper to compete with television. It is a television monitor. We can stream pictures, we can stream uh, audio, we can also stream full video. That's coming. It, it's going to be an amazing equalizer, I think. Um, 
When Adam Powell visited the show, he talked about how at least one newspaper is doing the same thing. Uh, this Does this not bode well for TV? Uh, it just gives people more choices. I mean, television has survived cable, it survived satellite, and it seems to have the ability uh, that radio has to evolve and change in order to, to provide new and different things for people. You know, technology is not a threat to news. Technology is just a new means of distributing and getting to people and getting to them wherever they happen to be. It's funny, you know, as kids in the 60s, we probably grew up with everybody listening to a transistor radio. Yeah. Well, nobody carries a transistor radio everywhere, but everybody's got the cell phone. This is the next place radio is going. You're going to be able to hear it on your cell phone. Is that turned off, by the way? It is turned off. I did remember. <laughs> I remember my TV manners. You mentioned your reporters a moment ago. What, do you, uh, what kind of people do you hire? What do you want your reporters uh, to, to be as they're in charge of all this technology and all these fast-breaking developments in radio news delivery, what kind of people are you? It used to be until a couple of years ago that we didn't want to hire somebody unless they had been a news director at a medium market with five to ten years worth of experience. That farm team, that's the farm system, has gone away because so many of those radio stations don't have news departments. And so we have a mix of amazingly young people right out of school and graybeards who are willing to teach them. Uh, we've probably hired um, uh, eight to ten interns in the past three or four years, uh, people who were interns who are now editors, writers, reporters. They're surrounded by people who've got experience at the networks, at the wire services, very experienced people who are willing to share what they know. And it keeps us hip. It was the interns who introduced us to new technologies. I mean, it wasn't that many years ago that a radio reporter came back and put everything on reel-to-reel -reel tape and then took a razor blade and a grease pen and, well, one day there were a bunch of interns who went out and they got some audio and they came back and the news director said, come on here and I'm going to show you how to use the razor blade and the grease pen. <laughs> they said, no, no, we want to use the computer. And she scratched her head. She had no idea what they were talking about. And they introduced us to something called Cool Audio. Cool audio, yes. which is now uh, Adobe um, runs it. But it's amazing what we can do with audio now, and we learned it from the interns. So these young people coming in are keeping us on our toes on new technology because they grew up with it. I, I had an amazing epiphany early on at, at uh, WTOP. Uh, we had our first 14 snowflakes fall in Washington, which in this town is enough to close schools and the federal government. So I made sure we got everybody in at the crack of Abandon dawn. Abandoned those cars. It, exactly. <laughs> um, and we, we manned the phones, and we got all the school closings and the work closings, and we got them on the air. And I'm watching the TV crawls and making sure that we have it as fast as any of the TV stations. Finally, about 7 o'clock, I took a break, had my first cup of coffee. I thought we did really great, and I turned on the computer. And there were 100 emails excoriating us for not having that information online as fast as we had it on the radio. All my life, I've been getting up in the morning and either stumbling to the door for a newspaper or turning on a radio or turning on a television. That's when it dawned on me. We have a whole generation of people who don't do any of those three things. They fire up the PC in the morning. That's where they get their information. And so for radio to continue to thrive, we've got to go where the technology is. We're not, strictly speaking, a radio news organization. We are an electronic news organization and we can, and we've started to, go wherever the new technology takes us. Anybody ever tell you you're going to have to learn how to calm down a little bit and be less enthusiastic about this Mrs. stuff? Mrs. Farley all the time. <laughs> <laughs> tell me about podcasting. Are you podcasting? I'm under the idea. I hear this um, little promo saying you can have eight minutes of everything you need. What's that all about? We are podcasting because there are people who can't take us along on their ride to work because they take... Uh, Metro or VRE or Mark, they're on a commuter train, and they can't listen to the radio. So we now do a morning podcast and an afternoon podcast that will bring them up to date in the morning. Here's what happened while you were asleep. Here's the top news stories, local, national. Uh, here's a little weather. Here's some sports scores. Here's a little money news. And we do the same thing for their return trip at 4 or 5 in the afternoon. We provide another one that they can take with them. Um, for a lot of young people, so, so let me understand it. 
they take it with them to listen to it later? What To listen to them while they're on the train or on the bus. Okay, okay. Uh, you know, they get their fill of news, and then they can go and uh, listen to uh, music on their iPods or whatever wow. MP3 players that they have. Hmm. The idea is they don't have to be without radio since they're not near a radio. They can take us wherever they go. And for a lot of young people, 20-somethings, this is the only association they have with an all-news radio station. So I'm hoping to hook them early. Um, if, if TV news is at its best, and I think it is, uh, during crises such as the Northridge earthquake or September 11th, when is radio news at its best? At exactly the same time when the big stories are there, during and after. You know, in the aftermath of a hurricane, uh, there's not a lot of exciting stories to show about people not having power or where you can get gasoline, but radio stations stick with that. They serve the community. Here's where you can get dry ice to keep your food. Here's a gasoline station, uh, a, a gas station that's gotten a delivery of gas and they have gas here. Here's where you can get the things you need. Radio becomes a lifeline. You just ask anybody who lives in Florida. This is something that uh, a competing technology like satellite radio is never going to be able to do to get down to that community level to give people that lifeline information they need in the aftermath of an emergency. And it runs on batteries. It runs on batteries. Battery-powered TVs run out of batteries a lot faster. I mean, our highest ratings come when the power's out, yeah. and they're all sitting at home listening to their battery-powered radios. You brought up satellite uh, radio, and it's fascinating uh, what's going on with it. Um, where are its limitations for disseminating information, and what are the possibilities for the future? Um, it, it has great potential for music, because they can play every mm -hmm. flavor of music. So a radio station that today that is nothing more than a jukebox is at risk from this new technology. But those radio stations, and there's more than just all news radio stations, those radio stations that serve their community are providing something that satellite radio is never going to be able to match. That information you need locally, they just don't have as many eyes and ears on the ground as those 13,000 over-the-air broadcast stations are providing for free. It's that lifeline in times of emergency. It's serving the community year in and year out. Satellite radio can do the big, bold concerts or um, uh, entertainment events. They can't get down to that local level in serving the community. And that's why radio is going to survive. So satellite, as presently constituted, is hooking into things like CNN radio news. Right. They can't provide local but news. But not local news. Not local news. And mm -hmm. they are trying to do local traffic. But I get constant emails from people who say, well, I tried XM or Sirius uh, traffic, and uh, you guys have nothing to worry about. They just can't. You know, it, it, the model for one of them, they have a whole bunch of people in one room, and they're doing traffic for cities all over the country, cities these people have never visited, have never seen. They haven't seen the highways. They're not even sure how to pronounce them, mm -hmm. whereas we have helicopters, fixed-wing aircraft, mobile units, and all of our listeners calling to tell us about the traffic problems. They just can't get the bulk on satellite radio that, that local over-the-air broadcasting can. So it's no threat at all to those 13,000 It's not a threat to those stations. who serve the community. It's a threat only to, their, to those whose radio station is nothing more than a jukebox. But people are willing to pay for it, and you can't... Um, you have to kind of say, gee, wouldn't it be great if we could figure out a way to, to have that happen for us? Uh, our model is still, uh, for commercial radio, uh, our, our model is still advertising-based, and it works. And I think that uh, as an industry, we probably learned that we had shot ourselves in the foot. And we ran too many commercials. There is a limit that people will put up with. I think almost all broadcasters have cut down on the number of commercials. Uh, it makes the radio more listenable, more useful for the listener. and. Um, more effective for the advertisers if they're competing with fewer commercials on a radio station. Again, radio has changed and evolved. Who are your, what, what is your demographic? Um, our sales department wants people who are 25 to 54. Uh, the bulk of our audience is probably between the ages of 45 and 65. Uh, the sales community says we'll only pay for listeners 25, 54, and in television we'll only pay for viewers 18 to 49. Now, one of two things is at work here. Either the advertising community is incredibly dumb 
in not realizing that the people turning 54 and older today are the baby boomers. They were always early adapters. These are the people with the great amounts of disposable income. Uh, and to say that we won't pay for these people, either they're really dumb in the advertising community and they don't realize this, or they're ripping off the broadcast community saying, this is all we'll pay for and we know we get all of those older affluent listeners and viewers for free. So you can draw your own conclusion. That demographics don't directly translate to ad dollars. That would be my conclusion. No, the, the, what they'll pay for is twenty five fifty four. Don't, those yeah, listeners, they don't necessarily. they'll pay for it. Uh -huh. uh, but you know, they've learned that all news radio station works. Where the WTOP is the top billing radio station in Washington because it works. When you listen to a music station and a commercial comes on, it's an interruption of what you came there for. Mm -hmm. Most of our advertisers don't do screaming car dealer ads. They do information. That's more of the reason people came to the radio station in the first place to get news and information. And the commercial is not nearly as out of place on an all-news station as it is on a music station. I don't, I don't really get the big push for younger listeners and, and on TV, the young viewer, when it's, as you said, older people who have the bucks. It, it's, it's not logical. Uh, it's not borne out by the research. But in, in an ad agency, the entry-level job is radio or TV buyer. So they got 21 and 22-year-olds placing all of the buys and thinking like a 21 or 22 year old and not necessarily thinking what's to the best advantage of my client how are they going to get results with with which people we reach that 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 explains a lot you once asked people to write down um, <clears throat> what stations they listen to and you found an interesting result tell me about that uh, we did a lot of research and asked people tell us all the radio stations you listen to in a week and invariably they wouldn't mention WTOP so then we'd prompt them, did you listen to any radio station for a newscast? Why, yes, WTOP. Did you listen to any radio station for traffic? Oh, sure, WTOP. Did you listen to any station for a weather report? Why, yes, WTOP. And then we'd ask them, well, then why, when we asked you for the list of radio stations, didn't you mention WTOP? And they'd say, oh, you said a list of radio stations. I thought you meant music stations. So the top of mind awareness that they have when they think of a radio station is to think of music. Uh, an all-news radio station is like a utility. You walk into a room, you flick on the switch, you expect there to be electricity. You walk into the kitchen, you flick on the faucet, you expect there to be water. You may not know the name of the utility that provides it, but you know it's always there. We can get taken for granted, which is why we go out of our way to remind people that, yes, we're all news and we're reliable, but we're still a radio station. We've got this annoying little... And I know it's annoying because people tell me all the time this annoying little slogan we use all the time, your favorite radio station doesn't play songs. And people call me all the time, why do you say that? That's so obvious. I know you don't play songs. Well, the fact that they're calling me about it shows that it works. I'm helping make it top of mind so that when the ratings are done and people get this paper diary from the Arbitron company that asks them to try to remember all the radio stations they listen to in the course of a week, we get the credit we deserve. Um, how do you monitor this community for the news it wants? There's, we know from surveys that people do want community news, and, and you've made the point that those 13,000 stations can do a whole lot more on the ground than satellite can do. But how do you know what listeners want? For example, the, the network-affiliated television newscasts in town have become super heavy on crime, and the crime lead, and that didn't few years back even used to be the case. Uh, I cannot believe personally that that many people want to hear about the lady, latest shootings and slashings, but, but there it is on a day-to-day -day basis. How do you go at what to give the community? The community monitors us. We get amazing feedback on a minute-to-minute -minute basis. You know, we constantly give out the email address, newsroom at wtopnews.com. You know, send the email and somebody in the newsroom is going to read that. And they want it, they, they'll ask us questions. Why are there sirens down at the end of my block? What was that sound I just heard in the air? Uh, why haven't you covered this issue? Didn't you know this Little League has made it to the Little League World Series? They're constant feedback from people on what they want. And we also do research. And yes, people tell us, 
I don't want to know about the stabbing or, or the robbery du jour. You know, they happen all the time, unfortunately. But when you can connect the dots for people, you know, when you can show that gang violence has been happening in a place like Montgomery County for years and really does not seem to have been acknowledged either by the school system or the police, you start to connect that dots and, and, and now it's relevant to people. If you have a crime wave in an area, if you have a serial arsonist, it's going to, it's not just one individual crime. You've connected the dots and made people that they, they realize that the ultimate crime story in this region was the sniper because it affected everybody, it paralyzed the region, it scared us to death. And that's when we became a lifeline to the community. We were almost nonstop. We dropped commercials at the top of a, at the drop of a hat. I mean, we we're giving people information like zigzag when you're going through a parking lot, or if you're getting gas, stand behind the gas tank because they've been shooting people from the streets. It was a scary time, and we were a lifeline at that point. I mentioned, um, we need to get a couple of things in, in a couple of minutes. I mentioned growing consolidation and what happens to the independents um, in, in, in this atmosphere, in this era. Uh, what do you think? Uh, will there be room for the independent broadcaster? Absolutely. Uh, there are, you can, in almost any city, you can find examples of small companies. Um, in fact, some of the smaller broadcasters, the, the Infinities, the, not the, um, I beg your pardon, some of the smaller broadcasters like Emmis, um, like um, Entercom, like, like my own company, Bonneville, um, they're providing more community service than the two big guys, uh, Clear Channel and Infinity. And in fact, um, th these medium-sized broadcast companies are often used as the model for, you know, what people on the Hill or people at the FCC think that broadcasters ought to be doing. Uh, and I think the consolidation craze that we had for a while is over, and I think that there are owners right now um, who realize that we prosper by serving the community. We have only about 30 seconds, but a radio man knows what that means. What are the next big things? Are the, is it spectrum radio? What, did, what is... What's the next big thing? It's wireless audio. Take us wherever you go, on your laptop or here. You're, every flavor of information that you need, we radio broadcasters can go there. Thank you, Jim Farley, so much for being on the program. And that is all for this time. I will see you next time on Changing Media. For Jim Farley of WTOP Radio, I'm Lee Thornton.